Hello health champions. What would happen if you stopped eating bread for 30 days? There's Ezekiel bread, white bread, wheat bread, whole grain bread, sprouted bread, sourdough bread. And you've probably heard that some of these breads are considered junk food, but you've also heard that some are supposed to be health foods. So how does that really work? Let's talk about bread. First of all, bread is about 80% of the weight is starch. And starch is a polysaccharide, meaning many sugars. So if you take individual glucose molecules and you string them together in chains and branches, hundreds and thousands, then it becomes a starch, a polysaccharide. And this is what a lot of people refer to as a complex carbohydrate. So they tell you individual sugars are bad for you, but complex carbs are good. Well, the problem is that within seconds, you start breaking off some of these individual glucose molecules and they quickly get into the bloodstream and that glucose is the same as sugar, which raises your blood sugar and that blood glucose is going to spike insulin. So not all of this starch is going to be broken down quickly, but the process to raise blood sugar and insulin starts instantly. And therefore, if you were to cut out bread for 30 days, you would see some blood sugar, some glycemic benefits. You would lower blood glucose, you would lower your A1C, even though that's a three to four month average, within 30 days, you would start seeing some benefits, some changes in that number. You'd see a lower fasting insulin, and based on glucose and insulin, we can compute your HOMA IR, which is a measure of your insulin resistance, and you would also probably see that that number starts coming down. Now, bread is not the only thing that will do this, but if you are more on the diabetic end of the spectrum and you cut out the bread, you would probably start seeing your values, your blood values start moving more into a healthy range. A lot of people have trouble with gas. So where does that come from? Well, it's made by bacteria in your digestive tract. But in order for them to make gas, you have to feed them. And they love all kinds of different carbohydrates, not just bread and sugar, but all sorts of carbohydrate. So the way this works is that glucose is absorbed rather quickly, but complex carbs are absorbed slower. So when you eat something, it first ends up in your stomach. That's number one. It sits there for a while and the glucose, the individual glucose, some of it starts getting absorbed already in the stomach, but most of it and all of the complex carbs are going to continue down into the small intestine. That's number two. And it takes many hours to go through this maze, this long, long tube they call the small intestine. And the further it goes through the small intestine, the more the complex carbs get broken down and the more of it gets absorbed as glucose. And the whole idea is that all of it or virtually all of it is supposed to be broken down and absorbed before it makes it to the large intestine, which is number three. And the large intestine is where most of your bacteria is, your gut flora. Uh, the large intestine has billions of bacteria per milliliter. The small intestine is only supposed to have thousands. All right. So by the time it gets to the large intestine, it's supposed to be absorbed. There's not supposed to be any carbohydrates left except fiber that we can't break down. So when it comes to carbs, there's basically a trade off that you can either raise blood sugar or you can feed your bacteria. So the glucose, the simple carbs, they're going to be absorbed very early. They're never going to make it down to feed the bacteria. So if it's simple carbs, then it's going to raise blood glucose. But if it's complex carbs, now it's going to feed the bacteria. So therefore, a lot of problem with digestive complaints, they're going to find that whole wheat is worse because it takes longer to break down. So it's going to make it further down the digestive tract. And a special case that affects a lot of people that give some severe problems is called SIBO. That's small intestine bacterial overgrowth. 
And like I said, we're supposed to have lots of bacteria in the large intestine and virtually none in the small intestine. But if we don't have a really tight ileocecal valve here, then some of the bacteria can backflow. And now instead of thousands, we might have tens or hundreds of thousands of bacteria in the small intestine. And now there is a whole lot of carbohydrates that aren't fully absorbed that they get to munch on and they produce a lot of gas. Now, if you truly have SIBO, then you probably have to cut out a lot more stuff than just bread. But for most people, if you cut out bread in 30 days, you will notice a lot less bloating. And a lot of people will say, well, what else is there to eat? Bread has been around forever, for thousands of years, right? Well, humans have been around for about a quarter million years in our current makeup. Our current DNA is about a quarter million years old. And during that time, we had hunter-gatherer DNA because most of our lifestyle during that time was hunting and gathering. So whatever those people did, whatever your ancestors did, is what your DNA is still designed to do. And it's not that they didn't have any grains at all, but there were only a couple of species of grain and they didn't eat a whole lot of it. They didn't cultivate it, they didn't grow it. They might stumble across a few grains here and there and they might put them in a soup or eat them the way they were, but we did not eat a whole lot of grains. But that changed about 10,000 years ago. So on this big long spectrum, 10,000 years is this red area. And that's how long we've had agriculture. We've been cultivating and growing it on purpose. So if we blow up that little area of 10,000 years to a larger scale, then we can see that's now how long we've had agriculture. But even though we were growing the grains on purpose, there were still only a handful of different grains. There were still just a few species of grains to choose from and they had been around for a good while. They didn't change very fast. And through the millennia and through the centuries that didn't really change from the Egyptians to the Romans and so forth until the last 50 years. Now we started hybridizing and changing and playing around with the DNA of those grains and now we have modern wheat and we have over 25,000 different types of wheat before we arrived at these modern versions. And if you can see this yellow little line that's just about a pixel wide, that's how long on this 10,000 year scale that we've had that modern wheat. So the point of all that is that even though grains have been around for a long while, we haven't eaten very much grain until we started agriculture and even then those grains were very very different from the stuff that we eat today which is basically an experiment that has lasted a blink of an eye. So now that we have these modern wheats they are optimized for yield. They have the best yield, they have the best durability, they're resistant to coal and floods and drought, they have the best pest resistance and they have the best baking properties. They've hybridized, they've developed these to have more gluten and to create more elastic and more fluffy, bouncy bread. What they haven't been concerned about at all is how humans tolerate these grains and how it affects our health. So just because something is relatively new doesn't guarantee that it's bad for us, but it's also not very reassuring because we know meat and vegetables have been around for 250,000 years. Our DNA knows how to deal with that. With grains, it's kind of a toss-up. And the more we change it, the less likely that we tolerate it well. I'm sure you can agree that the main purpose of eating is to get nutrients. So all these different foods have nutrients, but plant food and especially grains also have something called anti-nutrients. That means they contain chemical compounds that prevent us from absorbing the nutrients in the food. One of those is called phytates and phytates 
binds very strongly to minerals and when it's bound to a phytate we can't absorb it. So it basically blocks that portion of our nutrition. They also contain enzyme inhibitors. So your DNA is coded to produce enzymes that fit specifically into breaking down certain foods and if we have inhibitors of those enzymes then we can't break down that food or not break it down completely and it's primarily protein digestion that's affected. Some of those inhibitors are oxalates, tannins and gluten and we'll come back to gluten separately because that's a big one and another anti-nutrient is lectins which we'll also cover separately. Gluten has gotten almost all the attention when it comes to the pros and cons of grain and bread but gluten is really a mixture of hundreds of different proteins and then we can break those proteins down into two classes of protein where one group is called glutenin and it's more like strands and they provide the elasticity, you can stretch the dough. And the other class is called gliadins which helps the dough rise, helps the bread rise during baking. And the type and quantity of gliadins and glutenins in wheat is unique and that's why only wheat can make really fluffy bread and that's why it's so desirable. And a lot of people now, they would say, well, but I don't have celiac disease. I thought that wheat is just something that celiac people should avoid and that everyone else should eat it as a health food. But it's a little bit more to it than that. There's something called intestinal barrier resistance. So it's not like you have a barrier that's on or off. It's not like a door that you just open or close. It's a gradual thing that goes from like 100% of optimal barrier to 0% where it's basically totally leaky and dysfunctional. And if you have celiac disease, which affects about 1% of the population, then your intestinal barrier is already in pretty bad shape. And any time that you eat gluten, then it makes it worse. So just a smidgen of gluten is just going to put everything on fire. But then there is the group called non-celiac sensitivity that's getting more and more attention because there's a lot of people who notice that they feel bad, they get symptoms, even though they don't test for celiacs. So what's happening here is these people basically go from okay to bad. So whatever your level is, you're compromising it by eating something that increases the intestinal permeability. So if you go from okay to bad, then you're likely to have some symptoms. And there's about 13% of the population that are reporting symptoms. And that's why so many people stop eating gluten and they notice that they feel better. But notice this is self-reported. That means only the people who pay attention and have symptoms severe enough are going to actually tell anybody. So that number in reality is much, much higher. And in my office, we find that wheat is the number one sensitivity for most people. So what about everybody else? Well, if you have a good intestinal barrier resistance and you eat gluten, you're still going to compromise it. You're still going to affect it not maybe to the point where you have symptoms or maybe not to where you're going to notice the symptoms right away but this is the reason most people will benefit from limiting gluten whether you notice that it affects you or not. And then there's the class of lectins. The one in wheat is primarily called wheat germ agglutinin and what is that? It's a very sticky protein that attaches to epithelial cells and epithelium is a type of cell that makes up barriers or surfaces. So you have epithelium on the outside of your skin but it's the same type of cell that is on the inside of you as well. So any type of barrier or surface is typically going to be epithelial cells. And what happens is these sticky proteins 
they attach to little carbohydrate antennas on top of these microvilli. So you have larger villi, that's like little fingers, tiny, tiny fingers on the inside of your gut to increase surface area to absorb things. But then on the top of each little cell, you have microvilli, also called a brush border. And on top of those, there's little carbohydrates antennas and these wheat germ agglutins, these lectins, they're very sticky, they grab on and they won't let go. So now that causes a lot of stress, a lot of inflammation, and they start destroying that brush border. As a result, these lectins are very strongly associated with leaky gut. And when you have a leaky gut, your gut lets through particles that are too big that your immune system reacts to, and now you're more prone to autoimmunity. But that's not the only place that you have these epithelial surface cells. You also have them on the inside of blood vessels. And when these agglutinins stick to the blood vessels, now they create the same thing. They increase the permeability, the leakiness. And now some of these small oxidized damaged LDL particles that I've talked about in some other videos, they can get through these gaps and contribute to cardiovascular disease and to placking. But it doesn't even stop there. These lectins also affect your brush border enzymes. So you make enzymes to digest and break down food and some of these enzymes are cultivated. They're grown in the brush border. But if the lectins attach and compromise the brush border, they're also going to compromise your enzymes. So now you can't digest and absorb food and nutrients as well. But lectins have even been shown to stimulate insulin receptors, which means that they push you toward insulin resistance and lipogenesis, meaning you make more fat and you store more fat. And they can even block leptin, the activity of leptin, which is a satiety hormone. Your fat cells make leptin to tell the body that, hey, you know, we're pretty good here. We don't need any more fat right now. But if you block that leptin, now they don't signal and you don't feel the satiety, so you just keep on eating. So if you reduce bread or cut it out for 30 days, you're going to reduce the phytates, which means you'll be able to absorb minerals better. If you cut out the bread, you'll also avoid lectins and gluten. So you will improve the permeability, your leaky gut will get better. You will reduce the inflammation in your gut. Therefore, you'll improve the absorption of nutrients in general because your brush border is going to be allowed to regenerate and heal. And then you will also lessen your chances of autoimmunity, of irritable bowel syndrome, and just about any other digestive complaint that you have. Most of them are going to be likely to improve. It's not the only thing that can disturb your gut, but it's one of the absolute most important ones. And furthermore, you will improve your leptin and insulin signaling function. Therefore, you will reduce the tendency or the degree of type 2 diabetes. You will reduce your risk of heart disease. You will probably reduce your blood pressure. And because of leptin signaling better, you'll have less cravings and better satiety. And of course, because of those two, it will also probably result in weight loss. Now, a lot of people will say that, well, we can't give up bread. It's too important. It's a staple. It's shaped the world. It's helped us create the civilization as we know it. And that is true, that for humans to develop the cultures and the type of society that we have, cultivated grain and agriculture was absolutely necessary because it allowed people to not spend all of their time hunting and gathering. Instead, they could specialize. They could delegate the farming to some people and other people could go ahead and learn things and become teachers and merchants and so forth. And the grain has also helped to feed the masses, which is responsible for having the masses of people that we have on the planet today. But that doesn't mean that we're stuck in that model because we have a new world. The population growth is slowing down. It's plateauing in the next couple of decades. 
We have more technology, we have more resources, we have more know-how than we've ever had before. So if we want to, we can create smaller and sustainable farms that don't just rely on grains. We can grow a variety of crops and we can come back to some of the ancient grains that don't have all of these negative side effects. But then you ask, isn't that going to be more expensive? And yes, anytime that you improve the quality, it will probably increase the cost a little bit, but not as much as most people think. Not if we can develop systems and scale this. And the way you want to think about it is either you spend the money up front on quality food or you pay later for the consequences. So in the United States right now, we spend 8% of all of our spendable income on food, but we spend more than 20% of all our income on sick care. So we're super cheap about feeding ourselves, so we get really sick and then we pay for all that sick care, but it's not really solving the problem. It's just patching it up and keeping us alive. And if you get your bread from a grocery store, it's probably going to have some additives in it because they love to put things in there like seed oils and trans fats and various forms of chemicals like dough conditioners and emulsifiers and preservatives. And one in particular is potassium bromate that is banned in a lot of countries. So by giving up the bread for 30 days, you will get additional benefits in terms of less toxic burden and the organs that are going to thank you the most are your liver and your kidney. Now let's dig in a little bit on the stuff that gets really confusing to most people, like the different types of bread. Some supposed to be bad and some supposed to be good. And a lot of people don't even realize that white and wheat is the same thing, it's just processed differently. They're not different types of grain, it's all wheat. Now, if it's white, that means it's processed and they peel off the bran and they take away the germ and they only keep the inside called the endosperm, which is where the starch and the gluten is. If they make a whole grain bread, whole grain wheat, then they use the whole kernel and they grind it all down. But what does that mean in terms of the items that we talked about, the blood sugar, nutrients, etc. Well, for blood sugar, white and wheat, processed and whole grain is going to be roughly the same. I know that you've heard differently because they're trying to promote the whole grain as healthy, but there's like a 1% difference between the two. It's so slight that they're really the same. When it comes to nutrients, then the white is much worse it's kind of on the level of processed sugar. It's white sugar, white flour. It's the white trash. It's been processed. They've taken away the things that will spoil. So when they process it, they take away the germ and they take away the bran. So now you don't have any minerals. You don't lose a lot of the vitamins and you lose the fiber. But then we have to account for the anti-nutrients, the things that prevent you from absorbing the nutrients in there. And now the wheat is worse. But of course that doesn't really matter much because the white didn't have much nutrients to start with after we process it. Then we get to the celiacs and gluten effects and they're about the same because all the gluten is in the middle that you keep when you make the white bread. As far as allergies and lectins, now this is actually a lot worse with the whole grain because most of the defenses of the plant, the lectins, are in the shell on the surface and therefore if you eat the whole grain there's also going to be more things to be sensitive, more things to be allergic to. But obviously when it comes to fiber, the whole grain is going to be better because the white hardly has anything anymore. Now, I'm not a fan of white flour, white bread by long shot because it's barely better than white sugar. But if we talk about the real reasons that most people would benefit from avoiding bread, other than the glucose, which is about the same, 
The other important aspects are reactions to gluten and allergies and lectins. And when we look at those, they're either same or worse for the whole grain wheat. So you really want to avoid white, but wheat might be even worse. But all of this so far has been about modern hybridized wheat, which is what most people get. If you go out of your way and you look for some of these ancient grains, how are they going to compare? Well, blood sugar wise, they're going to be much better because the ancient grains had a lot more protein. They had oftentimes two, two and a half times more protein. The nutrients, anti-nutrients, I don't know. They're probably similar to the whole grain, if you eat the whole grain. But in terms of celiacs, allergies, and lectins, they're going to be much better because a lot of the gluten in the modern grains were developed on purpose. Every time they crossbred something, they had new kinds of gluten and they tried to develop more gluten so they could get fluffy bread. And whenever people have trouble with the modern wheat and they try some of the ancient, I'm not saying that it's a free for all, but a lot of people will find that they have no problem with the ancient grains. They have no reactions, even though they can't tolerate regular bread. Now, if you have severe problems, sensitivities or celiacs to the regular wheat, then you're not going to be able to tolerate ancient grains either. But if you're just a little bit sensitive, then the ancient might be better way for you and be much better tolerated. And sometimes people say, so I know I can't have bread, but what if it's organic? Well, obviously that makes no difference because all of the factors that we talked about are going to be exactly the same. The difference is that with organic, you're probably getting a little bit less chemicals and pesticides, but everything else is going to be the same. And then there's a very popular version of bread called Ezekiel. And is that really different? Not really. Is it better? Yes, because it's sprouted and very often they will use ancient grains, not always, but sometimes. But when they sprout it, they will break down some of the starches. They will enhance some of the nutrients with the sprouts and they'll have less of some of these irritating factors. Some of the lectins will break down as well, but it's not going to be night and day. They're still going to have most of those issues present. And for a certain percentage of people, it's almost impossible to stop bread. It's so hard to kick the habit because it's like a drug. What's going on here? It has to do with exorphins. So your body has all these chemical messengers, like people who run, they get a runner's high from endorphins. Those are morphine-like compounds generated inside the body. But if you add something from the outside that has the same effect, that's called an exorphin from the outside. And the gluten breaks down into smaller pieces called polypeptides, and some of those are, have been named gluteomorphins because they act as morphine. They cross the blood-brain barrier and then they bind into opiate receptors, into pleasure receptors in the brain. Now, if that seems a little out there, consider the following, that if you have a heroin addict who takes an overdose and ends up in the emergency room, they'll treat him with an antidote called naloxone. And that will block the opiate receptors and the effect of the heroin so they can hopefully survive. But the same thing happens to these gluteomorphins, that the naloxone will also block the effect of the gluteomorphin, which means that these substances are very related. And the way they tested that was to give this drug to some people at a buffet with lots of bread. And it ended up that these people ate 33% less calories. So now they got super excited and they thought, hey, we got the perfect weight loss drug. 
and they frantically started researching for something that they could mass market. But not so fast. Why does that work? Because it blocks a natural desire in the body. It blocks our reward pathway. We don't have these receptors randomly. They're there because we're supposed to have desires. We're supposed to have the drive to pursue things. And if we block that reward pathway, we also block the desire to pursue rewards. So the side effect of that drug is that it depresses the mood as well. But I can only imagine that they still would want to put this on the market and then they would have some directions for usage and they say, number one, make sure to take your anti-heroin drug with wheat, but don't forget to take your antidepressant along with it. And that's how it usually works in the medical model, that they see something that they can affect, they go in and they push it or block it, and then it puts an imbalance on it, and now they go in and they try to affect that, and then they have to compensate for something else and something else and something else. And the only way the body is going to work in the long run is if it can create its own balance. So what might happen if you cut out the bread for 30 days is a lot of people are going to have some withdrawal. But if you understand this and you understand that the body is designed to find balance and it rewires very quickly, then in just a few days you will actually feel a whole lot better. You will feel more calm, your mood will be more stable, you have better focus and you have more stability in your life. So I recommend that you just try it. Don't take my word for it. Stop bread for 30 days and then you notice the changes. Even better, write them down so it's really clear to you. And then after 30 days, now you can choose, do you want to stay off or do you want to try to reintroduce this? Chances are you're not going to have nearly the craving or desire for it, but if you decide to try it again to some degree, then try some of these more ancient ones because they're going to be so much better on your digestive system. So a few of them are einkorn, emmer, spelt, kamut, and rye. And the other recommendation would be that you do it once in a while. Do it as an add-on to your meals. Do not reintroduce it 8 to 11 times per day. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.